personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library Podcast, brought to you by Ammo.com. I'm here today with Sam Jacobs, and we're going to talk about one of the biggest names in American firearms, and I'm speaking of none other than Oliver Winchester. But before we get started, tell everyone the centipede (laughs) joke. Okay, so a man goes to a pet store, and he says to the clerk, Clerk, I would like a pet. I would like someone who can talk to me. And I would also, I like to drink as well. And the pet store clerk says, well, sir, I have just the pet for you in store. Here's the centipede. Now, not only is the centipede very talkative and can engage you in lengthy conversation, but he also happens to be a social drinker. The guy says, I'll take him. So the man brings home the centipede, waits until five o'clock, and then says to the centipede, hey, centipede, do you want to go to the bar with me? The centipede doesn't say a word. The centipedes are known to do. The guy says again, centipede, why don't we go to the bar together and drink some alcohol? The centipede is silent. The guy says, that gosh darn pet store clerk, he burned me. I should have known there's no such thing as a centipede that can talk and drink socially. The centipede says, cool your jets, cool your jets. I'm still putting my shoes on. Bum bum. <laughs> <laughs> um so Oliver Winchester uh did not yes. have a pet centipede as far as anybody knows. Yes. Uh many but... many millipedes though. That's on record. <laughs> yeah, right. Um he founded the Winchester Repeating Arms Company and a lot of people know the name but kind of less known is like what his what his actual involvement in um, gunsmithing and the development of firearms in the United States uh, was, in fact, yeah. uh, I think most people don't understand the role he played really at all. Um, and so we're going to get into that today and kind of clear up, you know, you know the name, you see it all the time when you go to the the range and you're, you know, buying ammunition, uh, which you should do at ammo.com forward slash podcast for $20 off any purchase of $200 or more. Mm. But let's talk about Oliver Winchester. So he was born in Boston, Massachusetts on November 30th, 1810. Um, Always interesting to me, you know, as somebody who grew up in New England, that New England was really, you know, the epicenter of gunsmithing and firearms manufacture in this country for most of its history. Yeah, I mean, uh, Colt was right in Hartford, Connecticut. Smith and Wesson, um, the Springfield Armory. Mm. I mean, there's a whole like, yeah. My great grandpa worked there. No kidding. Yeah, he worked at the Springfield Armory. I believe it was during World War I. Um, yeah, I mean, it's you wouldn't think that New England would be the center of gunsmithing in the United States. But I mean, I, I even as somebody who knows that, like, you know, New England is, is a lot more of a diverse place kind of mm-hmm. ideologically speaking than people who aren't from there would assume. Um, it surprises me that it was like the center of firearms manufacture. Um, he, Oliver Winchester, you know, did revolutionize American firearms, uh, but maybe not in the ways that people might think. Uh, he also was the 32nd Lieutenant Governor of the state of Connecticut. He was elected as a Republican. Um, underneath Governor Joseph Roswell Hawley, and he also was a great philanthropist of his time. Um, He gave a lot of money to Yale University, which is in New Haven, um, which if you've never been to New Haven, don't go. uh, (laughs) (laughs) Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, go somewhere nice in Connecticut, like... uh, uh... (laughs) (laughs) Um, for people who aren't from New England, New Englanders who aren't from Connecticut hate Connecticut. It's, oh it's, it's a thing. They make jokes about it on Family Guy and like everything. 
I grew uh, up yeah, in I grew up in a leaf peeper part of the world, and sure enough, the first leaf would turn orange in the fall, and every goddamn Cadillac Escalade with the Connecticut plate would drive up there to go two miles per hour down the road that you need to take to work and make you late for everything. And uh, I don't have fond memories of Connecticuters, although we love them very much and and wish to sell them ammo. Yeah, I, I, I I'm from a place in new england that nobody nobody would go to on purpose um even to look at leaves so i i never had to, i didn't even know leaf peepers were a thing but um in any event yeah he gave lots of money to yale university in new haven uh he was born on the on the outskirts of boston uh one of the weird things about this to me is that there's still farming going on in the city limits of boston at this time it's like when you see pictures from you know 1880 brooklyn and it's nothing but farmland Mm -hmm. um it's bizarre it's like impossible to to wrap my head around that this recently in human history people were uh farming in boston and brooklyn it does blow my mind i mean to imagine that you know manhattan used to be full of like muskrats and deer and beavers and stuff yeah and garden gardens you know like um very very strange so his family were kind of, you know, hand to mouth farmers. They did not, re- they did not make really any money farming. Um, and he did not have any kind of formal education that we're aware of. Um, he did, however, have a keen business sense and he, you know, he was, he was not a man who was afraid to get his, his, uh, hands dirty and to make things happen. He first apprenticed as a church builder, but quickly began earning a bit of money on the side as the inventor of a new style of shirt collars for men. Um, This was around the period of time in men's clothing and menswear when you wouldn't change your shirt, but once a week, but you would change your collar like every day. Mm. Um, Yeah, it's weird. Like they sold collars separately. I mean, people don't really have access to laundry. I guess because it's you can't be that you know the technology to make a collar didn't exist yet. It had to be a f- function of the fact that the collar gets dirty. Uh, is the visible part of the shirt that gets dirty quickly? Mm-hmm. You know because uh, you're wearing a coat and everything. So yeah, guys would you know buy collar. You can see this in old movies and stuff. Um, yeah, even in the forties, I, I yeah. seen uh, the celluloid collar. Yeah, it's absolutely. Not, it's not an excuse you can make anymore. Excuse me while I go change my collar. Yeah, I know. I know. Think of all that we've lost. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I never get an occasion to wear my spatter dashes anymore. You know, um, I've actually seen guys in spats. <clears throat> Were they uh, driving horse-drawn carriages? Or? No, it's it was like it's a it's a like L.A. rocker thing uh, to like put spats on over your, you know cowboy boots before your uh rat tribute band plays <laughs> some somewhere um yeah i've totally like seen dudes just walking down the street walking down I would like imagine if you, in LA if you frequent spats. the kind of rock clubs where people drink a lot it might be nice to have some protective covering over your shoes yeah i doubt that there it's that i'm sure that it's just like you know it looks cool i got some pink leopard print spats to go over my snakeskin cowboy boots kind of thing um, I think it's cool. You know, I, I, I respect it. I could never, I could never rock it, but that, um, that collar was his first, first patent, first of many. He, um, he started making garments in New York and New Haven. That was kind of his, the beginning of his business career proper. Uh, he also sold some men's furnishings in Baltimore. A men's furnishing. Yeah, I like, mean, you know, I, I, I guess it would be like, I don't even know why. I mean, it would be, you know, couches and stuff, but I don't know how they would like, you know, differ from a couch that your wife would buy for you. Maybe it didn't come with throw pillows. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, that was a success. He starts looking for new opportunities and he meets a man named Horace Smith and another man named Daniel Wesson. Um, you might have heard of a company that they worked on later, the Smith & Wesson Revolver Company. Um, they acquired a rifle design and improved, Smith & Wesson acquired a, a rifle design and improved it 
with the help of shop foreman Benjamin, Benjamin Tyler Henry, he of the Henry Repeating Rifle. And in 1855, they began manufacturing the Volcanic Lever Action Rifle. Um, that company was incorporated as the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company, and Winchester was the largest stockholder. And that's kind of his first company. And I'm going to take this opportunity to mention that uh, lever action rifles are awesome. Yes. Always love them. I mean, you can make any kind of argument you want in favor of gas box, but nothing is as satisfying as going Kirk Chack whenever you want a chamber one. Yeah. I think, I think that the like, I think it, I think it goes like, you know, lever action, uh, bolt action, and then semi auto for, you know, the, the coolness tears. You, you can't spin cock a semi-automatic like John Wayne and true get grit. Yeah. That's, like, that's the yeah. main problem. But you know why lever actions never really became super mainstream because, because the army never wanted them because you can't really reload when you're lying prone. Oh, that's interesting. That was like the main design flaw that kind of preempted its use in combat, which is why it's always going to remain a, an individualist's gun, a man in the saddle, so to speak. There was some limited success with the new rifle, and um, Winchester basically wanted to seize control over the company, which was failing at that time, and he did, and he, he took took it over and renamed it the New Haven Arms Company, uh, which also had very slow sales at first. Benjamin Henry improved the volcanic repeating rifle design. He enlarged the frame and the magazine uh, to accommodate the then new 44 caliber, not to be confused with the 44 Magnum, which is in- invented like close to 100 years later. Yeah, Elmer Keith. Yeah, which we have a, uh, a podcast and an article about, and you should go listen to because Elmer Keith, wow. There was a man. There was a man. Yeah. I'm not going to diverge any more than saying that because we have a whole episode on it. But like he was he was a man among men at a time of men. And uh, you should learn about Elmer Keith. So, you know, Benjamin Henry is really the guy who put this company on the map. And it was in 1860 that they received a patent for the Henry rifle. Uh, (laughs) Twelve thousand rifles were produced over the next six years, many of which were used in the war between the states. Um, Henry was not happy about his compensation, and so he filed a lawsuit attempting to obtain ownership of the company, and Winchester simply reorganized the company as the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, which soon produced its first rifle, the uh, Model 1866. Based on the Henry rifle, it had a wooden forend and an improved magazine, and there were some larger calibers, um, larger caliber rifles like the Model 1873, which is known as the gun that won the West. You know, there's a movie about it with James Stewart, uh, which I've never seen, but I'm sure it's great. That brought greater renown to the company across the country, but Winchester died in December of 1880, and it was after his death, really, that things started to take off as the Winchester Repeating Arms Company began collaborating with John Browning, is another name you might have heard of. That's when shotguns really start taking off for them. Uh, The Model 1885 is still in production. 20th century, the top engineer at the time is T.C. Johnson, um, and At the start of the First World War is when they really start booming. Uh, They became a major producer of the 30 6 M1917 Enfield rifle for the United States military and collaborated with Browning once again to develop the 50 caliber BMG. So they made an ungodly amount of 30 6 then, too. Yeah. And also, like, what's crazy to me is how, like, you know, Winchester is not a. Um, is not a gunsmith. He's not a ballistics expert. I, it, I, I, I'm not even sure that he was much of a firearms enthusiast. Um, he just kind of was a businessman who knew how to make some money. But what's crazy to me is how he works with like every name from that. Yeah. Like everyone but Sam Cole. Yeah. He really hit all the broad strokes. 
And it sounds like Henry didn't even like him all that much. I can't imagine he had kind things to say about the fella. I don't get the sense anybody liked him very much because everyone's well, having to fa- show you. He's always having falling outs. He's always, you know, reorganizing the company to keep this or that guy from getting their getting their due. Um, yeah, it's an he's an interesting interesting character. Um, he did. During the war, the Civil War, he borrowed a lot of money to finance the expansion of the company, and they used a lot. They had a lot of surplus capacity, and so they start manufacturing uh, kitchen knives. This is the, this is during the uh, sorry during World War One, so after the death of Oliver Winchester, um, but while the company is still you know going strong. That always interests me when firearm companies start making non-firearm things. Because, like, yes. uh, I know Remington made typewriters and, and roller skates. and uh, Winchester Tokyo, also made roller skates. Roller skates. Is there something about roller skates that you can just, you know, go from making rifles to roller skates? You just flip a switch on the machine? I would imagine that it has to deal do with access to the same raw materials. I mean, the one that's an outlier for me for Winchester is refrigerators, because refrigerators have high, highly specific parts that are only for refrigerators. Yeah, threatening you know, to ice a guy with your Winchester takes a different meaning. Yeah, but like you, you get what I'm saying. Like, there's you know, roller skates. Sure, they're just metal at this period of time, right? They go mm-hmm. on your shoe, and kitchen knives, like same deal. They're just it's metal and some wood, and if you're making guns, you've got that lying around anyway but refrigerators have you know refrigeration stuff in mm-hmm. them which are only used in refrigerators and so you know why refrigerators i don't know typewriters make sense to me because it's the same thing we yeah. got all this we got all the stuff you need to make a typewriter people yeah, are buying typewriters basically um, just 26 firing pins right right no for sure and we've got you know like all this excess capacity from the war and you know we don't want to just shut shut the factories down so um what can we make with them instead boy i just got a weird image of a gunpowder fueled refrigerator that <laughs> intermittently explodes so it can fuel the refrigeration process or you oh, know the terrible. world's first semi-automatic typewriter <laughs> it writes without you yeah <laughs> Eventually, you'll get the collected works of Shakespeare, though. Yeah, right. Anyway, none of this really worked out for Winchester. You know, that's kind of, I mean, maybe that's the thing. It's like none of this, none of this worked. They went into bankruptcy during the Great Depression, and John M. Olin's Western Cartridge Company bought the Repeating Arms Company, a Winchester Repeating Arms Company at auction in 1931. Um, they were like, we're going to restore this iconic American brand to its former glory, which thankfully for them, uh, World War II was right around the corner, and that mm. definitely helped. They produced the M1 carbine and the M1, man, I should know how to say this because we have an article about it. I got to go to the article to because I don't want to say it wrong because I'm embarrassed. Um, Garand. Yeah, rhymes with him. One, yes, exactly. Um, they produced those during the Second World War, but um, labor costs were on the rise because this is a unionized industry. Uh, other companies were undercutting them with cast and stamp production, which you know you get what you pay for. But some people, you know, if you if you can't afford a a thousand dollars for a shotgun, it doesn't really matter that the thousand dollar shotgun is way better than the $600 shotgun if all you got is $600. So, Olin sold the company back to its employees in 1980. They reincorporated as the U.S. Repeating Arms Company. Uh, Olin kept the ammunition business, which I'm sure was a lot easier to to manage. Um, And U.S. Repeating Arms went bankrupt in 1989. The New Haven plant closed its doors on January 16th, 2006. And um, I believe that that building is like, you know, condos for yuppies now or something, but I'm going to check. There's a lot of residential development, tenement buildings for one to 
uh, one to three families. And yeah, it's basically, it's, it's basically what you think. It's like, you know, row homes and, um, loft buildings and subdivisions and, um, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Exposed and, brick in the lobby, dog washing yeah, station. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm looking at some of it. Some of it is like what we call double decker or triple decker houses. Uh, some of it is row homes. I guess one of the buildings is a school. Hmm. What's this? That's like, yeah, row homes. I mean, it. I don't know. It's pretty much what you would think. Not. I don't know that anybody would want to go visit it. I don't think that there's really much left of the like heritage there, but I could be totally and completely wrong. Um, Olin Corporation in, in August of 2006 entered into a licensing agreement with Browning to make Winchester brand rifles and shotguns once again. And so the Model 1885, the Model 1892, and the Model 1886 are all produced in Japan uh, by the Moroku Corporation before being imported into the United States by Browning. The rest of the Winchester rifle and shotgun line are made in Europe by Fabrique Nationale de Herstal. Yeah. I know I'm saying that horribly, but you yeah, know. they make the, uh, the five, seven, they, uh, they designed the 5.7 cartridge, which, uh, people say it's cheaper to just let a mugger rob you than actually shoot him with it. Is it is that a, is that a popular in Europe cartridge? No, actually, it's it's like a high velocity pistol cartridge that I would imagine your typical European would think is ghastly and barbaric. Um, yeah, it's uh, you know those really sleek looking personal defense weapons with the weird curly handles that you see in James Bond movies that we yes. can't get here. Yeah, yeah. Th- those are designed for for I believe the five point seven cartridge because it's low recoil, high velocity, just. No one could argue it's for uh, anything but roughing up enemies of the state. Um, Olin continues to make Winchester branded ammunition. And one of the other things, too, is that, you know, some of the most popular cartridges in human history have been uh, developed by Winchester uh, 308, Winchester 270, Winchester. 50 BMG, 32 Winchester Special, 243 Winchester, uh, 22 uh, Winchester, also known as Winchester Magnum, or sorry, the Mm. 22 Magnum, uh, 300 Winchester Magnum, the 3030 and the 308 Winchester are some of the best-selling cartridges in firearms history in North America, which Mm -hmm. is pretty crazy to think about. Yeah, they have quite a track record. I think the 308 win might be still the most popular hunting cartridge. Um, yeah, even now, huh? I believe it still is. Although, please uh, send angry tweets to to Sam Jacobs Twitter <laughs> if I'm wrong. Yeah, right. At Sam Jacobs 1776 for angry comments. Um, there's a woman named Sarah Lockweed Party Winchester who was the widow of William Wirt Winchester and. She was the heiress to a significant portion of the Winchester family fortune, but she believed that the family was cursed because oh, that's of the weirdest thing. What she did, I forgot about this girl. Um, well, d- d- you tell the story because I have basically said everything that I know. Oh my god! So the, the Winchester heiress was uh, also given to magical thinking, and she, a somewhat impressionable and unbelievably wealthy lady became a popular target for mediums and psychics and other snake oil salesmen. Now, one particularly persuasive psychic told her that she was cursed by all the people what got killed by Winchester firearms. And the only way that you can prevent them from haunting you is to never finish building your mansion. And I don't know if the psychic's brother-in-law was a contractor or what, but basically this lady, her entire life just poured countless millions, and we're talking old day millions, into perpetually expanding and building her mansion, and I believe it's California. And this mansion, it's like a a trillion square feet. It is always going nowhere. Stairways that just go into the ceiling. Uh, just, Just totally nonsense layout. 
and uh, indirectly wound up building one of the creepiest buildings in the country. You can take a tour of it to this day and look at all the nonsense architecture in there. It looks like something M.C. Escher would have drawn up while he was on acid. And uh, that's that's one of the most interesting legacies of the Winchester fortune. It's this, this nonsense Alice in Wonderland mansion that this poor woman built to avoid getting haunted. That's a... Uh... It's very strange, to say the least. Yeah. Um, the Winchester Mystery House is what it's called. Um, another, That's it. Yep. And another descendant, uh, Laura uh, Trevelyan, I want to say. Trevelyan, maybe. Uh, BBC reporter wrote about her great, great, great grandfather in less than glowing terms in a uh, magazine called Country Life. Hmm. Winchester really is one of the more influential Americans, uh, you know, shy of like, you know, Abraham Lincoln or something. I'd say he's, he's at least as influential as um, Thomas Edison, whether he designed these or not. I mean, I think is kind of less important than the fact that he was the man who got them into the hands of the American public through his business and through his manufacturing efforts and um yeah like i'm kind of uh, you know i like um definitely the type of guy who thinks that um, american industrial design is one of our best art forms um mm. and i think that you know the winchester gun that won the west is uh which is the uh, 1873 is every bit the equal of, you know, a Camaro or hmm. a pair of Levi's or, you know, uh, Coca-Cola. It's not really industrial design, but, you know, I think that our commercial endeavors are stunning and astonishing and are, you know, when people say that America has no culture, it's like, well, you know, we only make the coolest cars and guns in the entire world so um I guess people who say culture. america has no culture i encountered their type i used to work at a restaurant this summed it all up i used to work at this restaurant germans would come in a lot germans would very frequently look at the beer list and disparage american beer ignoring all the little cute micro brews and craft stuff that they had on the menu because they only ordered budweiser so yeah if you're only aware of budweiser and american cheese and pepsi and all that other stuff it's easy to, you know, look over the authentic American experience that uh, you're just not going to get at Tesco in London. And uh, I will go on the record as saying that I think that Miller uh, High Life is America's greatest beer. Yeah, it's fair enough. I mean, if you define it as beer. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of these popular rounds, I'm looking right now, or these, you know, iconic Winchester rounds, I'm looking right now on ammo.com where by the way you can go to ammo.com forward slash podcast and get twenty dollars off any order of two hundred dollars or more uh we do have some uh 50 bmg in stock right now yeah straight from lake city yeah and we also have some uh winchester 308 in stock right at this very moment um I would urge you to go to ammo.com forward slash podcast and check out what we've got. We generally have a pretty good assortment. I know that things are difficult to come by at this time, but generally if you go to our website, if we don't have what you're looking for, come back in a couple of days, check the stock again. We, we Things turn over very, very quickly. So please do check back if we don't have what it is that you're looking for. Uh, again, that's ammo.com forward slash podcast. You get $20 off any order of $200 or more. This has been the Resistance Library podcast from ammo.com. For Dave Trello, this is Sam Jacobs, and we will see you next time. Thanks for listening.